Very special thanks to Affordable Prestige Cars in Glastonbury for providing the Bentley in this review, and if you are a follower of Beards and Cars here on the channel, you'll doubtless recognise that I've worked with these gents a lot, especially when it comes to Jaguar reviews, but as you can tell from my Bentley and Rolls Royce videos, they do feature other stuff as well, so if you are in that part of the UK and you want to check out their current stock or maybe even get them to source you a car, click the link in the description right below this video and check out what they've got. Well, it's about damn time, if I don't say so myself. For those of you who don't know, the behind the scenes of Beards and Cars is that next to perhaps only Ferrari, sourcing a Bentley Continental GT for a review has been the biggest bane of my existence as a car reviewer on YouTube, because the amount of times I've tried to make this happen with various Bentleys, and it's fallen through, or they've sold, it just hasn't worked out. But we are finally here, and major spoiler alert, it was absolutely worth the wait. Because, off the top of my head at least, I may actually have to say that this is in my top 5 favourite cars that I've driven in the series thus far. And if you've followed Beards and Cars, or at least watched many or most of the episodes, you know that that's saying quite a bit, given the other cars that I've driven. Now this car suits me down to a T, and I'm going to cover incidentally some of the reasons why, of course from an objective point of view as well as purely a reviewer, but also to do a bit of housekeeping first. In case you were wondering, for example, which particular Bentley am I going to be talking about, which variant, which model year, etc., as an overarching idea of what to expect, you should expect this to be a review that covers the initial 2003 model all the way up to the end of that first shape, which includes this facelift. So like 2003 to 2010 slash 2011, before the official second generation came in, and of course they introduced that V8. Now doubtless I'll drive one of those and maybe even the latest one at some point in the future, but this exact car is the facelifted 2010 shape, it's of course the GTC, as you can tell from the fact that it doesn't have a roof, and it's the speed version, which means it's even quicker. Because as we all know, the 550 horsepower base model was just never really quick enough. <laughs> now in my opinion, it's already a fantastic car in terms of performance, but sure, make it even quicker if you want to. So that's exactly what Bentley did. Now something which certain people may not know is that the Continental GT was actually the first time that we saw a tangible result of the Volkswagen Bentley merge in 1998. This was the first car that they produced together. And what a debut. I mean, this car in my opinion suffers from what I sometimes call the Bugatti Veyron effect or the Nissan GTR effect. And that is essentially to the idea of familiarity breeds contempt. If you have something that's fantastic, that bursts onto the scene and is really good, maybe even a class leader in many ways, well even so, if the car sticks around for long enough, you start to become over-familiar with it and kind of take it for granted. I think that that may have happened for some people with the Continental GT. However, I think that Volkswagen and Bentley have done an outstanding job of keeping this car relevant, because you could argue it's as least as popular and at least as relevant now as it was when it burst out into the scene in 2003. Now, of course, it's bigger, it's more chiselled, there are even faster versions. As I said, they introduced the V8 with better economy and still great performance, special editions, etc. And let's not forget, of course, that back in 2005, it spawned the Flying Spur, essentially a four-door version of the same idea, which, if I recall correctly, was basically the fastest four-door car in the world, apart from perhaps something like a Brabus rocket. However, this exact version is basically, in my opinion, kind of a perfect spec. It's the first shape, which still has those curves, it has a price advantage over certain newer ones, which are still closer to six figures, but it's the open top, and many times I'm not hugely into the idea of actually buying an open top, because they can break, you tend to lose some trunk space with storage, etc, etc, plus sometimes I just prefer the look of a hard top, 
but this car suits it. Much like a Rolls-Royce drop top, it's like a land yacht in the best ways. It's also the speed version, as I said, so it has that extra performance as well. Now, even the original base model with that gorgeous 6-litre twin-turbo W12 engine already had 552 horsepower. And that was already nearly a 200 mile an hour car. 0 to 60 is about 4.7 seconds, basically 196, 197 miles an hour. And of course, with all wheel drive, which is fairly rare to see in a GT car. And personally, I'm a huge fan of that, as I've said on the channel before. This one, with those updates, ups the power to 600 horsepower, ups the torque to 553 pound feet which, interestingly, is the exact same amount of torque that the Volkswagen Touareg V10 had, my first car, so of course I've got a soft spot there. And we're going to come back to the Touareg in a bit, so bear that in mind. And, incidentally, that's 750 newton meters of torque for those who are wondering. Now, the great thing about that engine, and don't take this the wrong way, owners or fans, because it's not an insult by any stretch, it feels like a diesel. But I don't mean in terms of the way it sounds, I don't mean in terms of the emissions it puts out, I mean that this engine never feels like it's putting in any effort of any kind. This car feels like if you strapped it to something, you could potentially make the planet turn the other way. It's got so much torque at barely 1700 RPM that you just never need to do more than rest your foot on the accelerator and suddenly the horizon gets a whole lot closer. Except it does it in a car that is obscenely heavy. I mean, let's be honest, 2.4 tons is ridiculous for a two-door car. It makes a Nissan GTR look flyweight in comparison. In fact, if you took a Nissan GTR, you could essentially stuff a Lotus Elise inside it, and it would still be only about the same as what this weighs anyway. That's massive. Barely Range Rover territory in a two-door coupe, or in this case, convertible. Now of course you also have four seats, and even though I'm not going to say that the rear ones have the best leg room around, they are at least proper size seats in comparison to something like a DB9 or my own former Jag XKR. This definitely has an advantage there, and as you'll see in the video, the trunk space is pretty nice as well, even on the convertible. So in terms of space and practicality, it still has everything you realistically want from a Grand Tourer, albeit one with the power of a Dodge Viper ACR and the torque of a Touareg V10 and the performance of, in a straight line at least, something like a Porsche 911 Turbo. Now, of course, around corners, something like a Nissan GTR or a Porsche 911 will probably beat it on the twisty stuff, but in most real-world conditions, you don't honestly need much more than this. Even the regular car with 550 horsepower feels like you can crush continents, hence the name. This one with 600, it really does feel like a supercar wrapped up in this elegant, classy, luxury body. In fact, the way that I would describe the way this car feels would be something along the lines of everything I loved about my own Touareg, which, unless you've driven one, doesn't really make much sense, but you'll have to just take my word for it, combined with my Jag XKR. It has that kind of sleek, almost supercar-esque British elegance of an Aston, a Jag, a Bentley in this case, but it combines it with all of that really obvious German engineering, the kind of build quality that the Germans imbue the car with, which, let's be honest, Jaguar and Aston, they just don't hold up as well in many cases, in terms of interior, in terms of the fit and finish, etc. Not to say that nothing can break, of course, we're going to get to that in a second. And in terms of even its performance, the choice of all-wheel drive, the choice of this unique W12 engine, which of course they also used in a version of the Touareg. They took the turbos off and made a 450 horsepower Touareg W12. They also used that engine in Volkswagen's Phaeton, which is essentially a Bentley flying spur, but with a more understated look to it. So this technology much of which I would wager is probably partially, at least due to the trickle-down effect of the Veyron project, it does stand the test of time. To this day, this 11-year-old car still feels like it could wipe the floor with most other cars on the road, without even breaking a sweat, except it can simultaneously have four actual adults with actual legs seated inside it, with their luggage, with the top down, soaking up every bump in the road, never feeling like you're even approaching losing any kind of traction, 
and just wafting across entire continents like it's nothing. And even in the entire time that I drove it, the fuel gauge didn't even move that much. Now, the fuel is one of the things that, of course, you'll want to consider if you plan on using one of these as, for example, a daily. Now, in the case of something like a Speed or a GTC, it's not so much daily driver territory, and I know most people probably wouldn't use them for that, but let's say, for example, you're on a budget of 15 to 20 grand, you're willing to go for a higher mileage, earlier car, maybe a, the Coupe with 550 horsepower, you absolutely could use that every day if you wanted to. That's coming from someone who uses a Maserati as a daily, I used a Jag XKR as a daily, I know what it's like to daily a high-performance car, even with high costs. Those costs, though, really are the only honest downside I can find with this machine. And I hate to be able to say that because this car, as I mentioned earlier on in the video, almost perfectly suits everything I love. It ticks every single box. And I actually have been tempted to buy one before myself. The reason why I didn't, though, is because if and when these do break, even in a minimal way, which seems like it shouldn't cost that much, they really do. For a minimal bit of maintenance, you will be paying through the nose. And if something major needs doing, you'll still be paying through the nose and probably every other orifice as well. Because, for example, if you, for instance, as someone I know had to do, replace a turbo hose going through the official Bentley specialists, well, the hose itself is about 300 pounds. That sounds like a lot of money, because it is, except the job itself required removing the engine to do so, so it was actually £5,000. I happen to also know from reading owners' forums that if you have to replace the rear window on the coupe, for example, because the heating elements don't work anymore, well, it's about three and a half grand just for the glass and the heater. So in order to run one of these, you need a lot more than just the purchase price. And that is ultimately honestly the only thing that held me back from actually buying one and you have to bear in mind that's coming from somebody who bought a maserati twice and still owns one now as my daily driver when a maserati owner tells you that something's risky you should take it to heart that's kind of like somebody with a tvr telling you that something was too dangerous for them it should make a certain impression and i think that that's a shame because if there is a way around that and absolutely go to owners' forums and research this for yourself. If you, for example, were able to, in a similar way to what I can do with my Maserati, use, for instance, Lancia Thesis parts for it, because some of them are carried over. If you were able to do a similar thing for this car, maybe use Volkswagen Phaeton parts, or Audi A8 or S8 parts, which it also shares tech with, or in some cases, maybe even Touareg parts, the steering wheel design of the first Continental is exactly the same as the Volkswagen, then I'm sure you could cut costs massively. In fact, buying a second Continental GT, if you could afford it, probably isn't a bad idea. Ultimately, though, that is the biggest question that you need to be able to answer. It's not about whether or not you can afford to buy a Continental GT, it's about whether or not you can afford to live with one, fix one, and run one. My advice would actually be the same as the advice that Affordable Prestige themselves give in the case of this car. This car is £55,000, which is a lot compared to some that you can find that are older with higher miles. This one though barely has 30,000 miles. It's a great spec, in great condition, and it's the speed, so it's even quicker. Plus it's the GTC. That's the kind of route you need to go down. And for those who are wondering, no, I'm not being paid to say that just because they're selling the car. It's actually the same advice that I used myself and would always recommend in terms of buying a Maserati. It's a mistake that I had to learn from. You can buy a high mileage car like a Bentley or a Maserati for dirt cheap money. But there's a reason. Once they get past a certain point, the cost to benefit ratio just becomes too drastic. My advice is don't buy a cheap Bentley. If you can afford to get one that is more in the 30, maybe even 40, 50 grand region, you're going to have a much safer bet. Even then, it's not to say that it won't have issues, because of course any car can, but it's a much, much safer bet. And if you think about it, it's not too crazy an idea, because you could spend 30, 40, 50 grand on one that's already good, or you could buy one for 15, 
and if you realistically hope to keep it, end up paying thousands and ending up at a similar price at the end of the day just to keep it on the road. Except you won't have anywhere near the resale value that one of those for 30, 40, 50,000 will have. So it's a choice that you have to weigh up. If, however, the option of swapping it out with Phaeton Tuareg A8 parts is there, and I'm sure some people have tried, then sure, go for it. If you can make it that much cheaper, maybe even do certain things yourself, or go to a non-specialist who's capable enough to work on these cars, then you could bring the costs right down, realistically speaking. It's just a really important choice that you need to weigh up, and honestly, it is the only downside of any merit to this car. Otherwise, in every sense, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in it, I absolutely adore this car, and I don't throw around words like magnificent that much in this series, but if there was ever a car that deserved to be called that and to have that moniker, it's this one. This car is magnificent, and I love every second of it. But ultimately, that's it for my thoughts. Of course, stick around on the channel for more car reviews. If you want to check out some of the other vehicles which I alluded to, like Astons, Jags, Rolls, etc., then of course, click the playlist on screen and see every episode of this series. And until next time, I'll see you then. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.